Now let's revisit our monetary policy and its effect on the aggregate demand curve. If we have a recessionary output gap, we will typically use expansionary monetary policy in order to close the output gap in order to stimulate aggregate demand. Whenever we have output higher than potential level, now we can use a contractionary monetary policy that will dampen aggregate demand. This diagram over here is elaborating the same. You can see expansionary monetary policy is going to stimulate our investment and consumption and they force put upward pressure on AD. AD is increasing and shifting to the right. Whereas contractionary monetary policy is higher interest rates, dampening investment and consumption, and therefore decreasing aggregate demand or shifting it to the left. What we have seen so far in this course is a very simplified version of monetary policy. Monetary policy transmission mechanism is actually quite more complex than the one we have seen. Monetary policy actually comes into effect not just through interest rate changes, but it also affects our asset prices like prices of stocks and bonds in the economy. If you have a flexible exchange rate regime, your changes in your interest rates by the Bank of Canada will also affect the value of the Canadian dollar or the exchange rate for the Canadian dollar. And it also affects the expectations about the future. So expectations about future inflation, expectations about future growth of GDP. All of these together will have effect on our consumption, investment, net exports. So basically components of our aggregate demand. All of these components of aggregate demand are affected through these transmission mechanisms over here and by stimulating AD or dampening AD depending upon which way we are moving the interest rate target we will then achieve our monetary policy goal. A major monetary policy goal is inflation targeting so we want inflation to be at its target level. In Canada the target level for inflation is about 2% but it's not strictly enforced. Bank of Canada allows inflation to fluctuate between a band of one to 3%. In our course, remember, we've only focused on this particular transmission mechanism and we have ignored all of these others. We will be looking at them in later chapters or in higher level courses in more detail. There are two types of monetary policies. We have backward looking monetary policies or forward looking monetary policies. A backward looking monetary policy is one that is based upon the current inflation gap or the current output gap. Whereas a forward looking monetary policy is which is targeting some inflation rate in the future. So it anticipates that inflation will be at some level, let's say six months or one year from now. So in anticipation of that inflation level, they will start acting today. So maybe they don't want the inflation rate to be too high in six months so they will start putting downward pressure on aggregate demand curve through contractionary monetary policy today in order to ensure that in six months or a year inflation will be not at a very high level and it will be curtailed likewise if they're anticipating inflation to fall below its target in that case they will start stimulating the economy today through expansionary monetary policy in order to have stable inflation in the future they will now set an explicit target for the inflation rate in our case as i said earlier that's 2% and our monetary policy is always going to adjust in order to ensure that we maintain this inflation target. Remember aggregate demand can be stimulated in order to put upward pressure on inflation and aggregate demand can be dampened to put downward pressure on inflation. Advantages of inflation targeting is that it reduces the uncertainty in our economy. Everyone knows what is the inflation target and it is also making your monetary policy very transparent. If Bank of Canada is able to to maintain the inflation target, everyone in the economy can observe that and therefore we have a lot of transparency in the conduct of monetary policy. This transparency makes your central bank also very accountable. If your central bank policymakers are unable to achieve these inflation targets, they can be replaced. So they know that they have consequences in the event that they are unable to maintain these target levels in the long run. A drawback of inflation targeting is that sometimes it can be too restrictive. So for example, during the big financial crisis of of 2008 2009 we had a severe output gap output was drastically below the potential level and in the face of such a big recession now the central bank will let go of its inflation targeting and is now more concerned about bringing the economy out of its recessionary output gap. So we do see that in times of crisis or unusual circumstances, central banks will let go of the inflation targeting in order to focus on areas of immediate importance. Now in the last part of this chapter, we're going to look at what is the role of monetary policy in the long run. So let's assume that we are at E1 in our macroeconomy and we're also correspondingly at equilibrium in the money market. Initially, our interest rate is at I1, price level in the aggregate economy is P1 and output is at potential. 
So this is what we call a general equilibrium in the macroeconomy. Everything is hunky-dory. Now let's assume Bank of Canada pursues expansionary monetary policy. So expansionary monetary policy, remember, is reduction of interest rates by increasing money supply. So in this diagram over here, we'll see money supply increasing. As the money supply increases at my initial interest rate over here, it's creating that surplus in the money market and the surplus drives down the interest rate. As interest rates are driven down to I2, we see that this is now going to stimulate aggregate demand. So the short-term impact of this expansionary monetary policy is money supply increased, interest rates went down and they caused consumption to increase, investment to increase and aggregate demand to increase. Our macro economy is at E2 and therefore we can see price level has been pushed up, GDP is pushed up above potential and unemployment is now a lot lower than the natural rate. Is this higher output level sustainable? As we learned in our previous chapters, this higher output level is not sustainable. Whenever we are overheating our economy, we are producing a lot higher than our potential level. In the long run, wages are going to be pushed up. As wages are going to increase, firms are going to see declining profits and therefore they are going to reduce their production. And so short-run AS starts to decrease. And we see short-run AS, in this case shifting to the left, to short-run AS2. The new equilibrium point between our AD2 and short-run AS2 is now at E3. And this will obviously happen over time, gradually, depending upon how quickly wages adjust. But eventually in the long run, you can see our output has gone back to its potential. So the expansionary monetary policy just created a business cycle expansion in the short run. In the long run, output has gone back to potential. So you can see monetary policy has no lasting impact on our real GDP. It's only creating upward pressure on our prices. Prices note had gone up in the short run, but in the long run, as wages have gone up, prices have gone further up to P3. So P3 is our long run aggregate price level. And as the aggregate price level is now a lot higher in the long run, our money demand will also increase proportionately. And as money demand increases, we see nominal interest rates also being driven back up. So in the short run, they had gone down because of expansionary monetary policy from E1 to E2. But in the long run, as money demand increased, interest rates have gone back up. So this is what we call money neutrality. Money is completely neutral in the long run. It does not create any real changes in our economy. It does not have any impact on your permanent GDP, does not lower the natural rate of unemployment, and the only impact it really has is on our aggregate price level or on inflation. So this diagram is very useful for understanding neutrality of money. However, I can also use this analysis for one other thing. Note that Bank of Canada can target any inflation rate in the long run. If I want to maintain the price level of P3 in the long run, all I have to do as central bank today is stimulate the economy a little bit today. We are creating more jobs, we are reducing our unemployment, higher production. This production level will automatically be reduced in the long run, but at the cost of higher price level. So Bank of Canada, which is forward looking and wants to increase the overall inflation in this economy, thinks this inflation rate might be too low, can always use expansionary monetary policy to achieve this higher target level in the long run. Likewise, we can also do this in reverse. Let's assume we are now starting at E3. A central bank which feels that this level of price level or the inflation rate is too high, they can actually put downward pressure on inflation even if there is no output gap by dampening AD today. So they can use contractionary monetary policy cause a recession in the economy. So this is a deliberate recession caused by a central bank. But why are they causing this recession because they know in the long run output will adjust back to potential in doing so prices will be pushed further down and we will bring our inflation rate to its target level so money neutrality while telling us that yes money does not have any effect on the real economy on real gdp natural rate of unemployment and it only affects our inflation rate flip side of the coin is that it is extremely useful tool for targeting inflation in the long run bank of canada can pretty much choose any target level in the long run whether higher or lower than the current inflation before we wrap up our discussion for monetary policy today there's one more thing that we have to go over and which is the problem of the zero lower bank so we know we can use monetary policy to achieve 
achieve any inflation target in the long run. We can use it to close inflationary gaps or recessionary output gaps. But one main disadvantage of monetary policy is the zero lower bound. The zero lower bound refers to the fact that you cannot keep on putting downward pressure on interest rates. We cannot have zero or negative nominal interest rates. So once the zero lower bound is hit, central banks will typically move on to non-conventional monetary policy tools. And these non-conventional monetary policy tools can be in the form of quantitative easing or large scale asset purchases in which the central bank is providing liquidity to financial markets through purchasing of long term bonds. So quantitative easing is a non-conventional monetary policy tool which central bank will use once we have reached the zero lower bound. There are also many other non-conventional monetary policy tools that we can look at, for example, forward guidance or changing of expectations. But for the purposes of this course, we will now stop here.